Well, my name is uh, Frank Fear uh, for Future You, and I want to welcome all of you, both in the house and also watching on YouTube, to a very special program today. You know, when you think about what higher education is, what it's supposed to be, and what its function is in society, and you think about college athletics, there really is a natural fit. Uh, one of our panelists, Ellen Strauski, has written about this, uh, and it's, it makes a lot of sense. What's happened over the decades, though, is that increasing commercialization uh, has converted the revenue generating sports into really a commercialized industry that is more uh, pro-like in stature than it is in terms of amateur. And the link between uh, those sports and higher education is getting most tenuous. Give you an example. One of the things that happened just yesterday is that a member of the public posted in a municipal newspaper a concern about her school signing a contract with a sports betting operation. Uh, and the school put a very positive spin. And she was raising questions about, is that appropriate? And she said, no. Um, and that ignited a conversation on Facebook. And I was pleased to see the back and forth about that. So again, one of the angles here we hope is that the general public will become more, not only knowledgeable about what's happening, I think they already know, but can navigate or really walk a tightrope, loving our sports, loving our teams, loving our schools, and asking, um, can we be better? And can we migrate back to a situation where there's a much better fit uh, between the mission of higher education and what we're seeing in revenue generating sports? Uh, let me turn now to uh, our panelists because we just have a stellar group of panelists. Uh, the first person um, who will be speaking uh, is Jason Kelly, who is associate editor of the University of Notre Dame Alumni Magazine, uh, and he also serves as the interim director of Notre Dame's Journalism School. And it's an article that, that Jason wrote that was published in Notre Dame Alumni Magazine that really stimulated our thinking. Uh, and it, he wrote about the line being crossed, the next line being crossed. Thank you very much for being here, Jason. Thank you for having me, Frank. Glad to be here. Appreciate it very much. Uh, I mentioned Ellen before. Ellen Starowski is a professor uh, at Ithaca College, and I've been reading Ellen's work for, for some time. She, she does an incredible job of covering a variety of topics and issues that are associated with, with uh, intercollegiate sports. She's also a fellow. Uh, of the North American Society for Sports uh, Management. She's nationally, internationally prominent, an advocate for college sports reform with emphasis on these topics. Among these topics, there are others, social justice, gender equity, uh, and her book, uh, which I read some time ago, co-authored with Alan Sack, uh, another professor who actually played football for Notre Dame, uh, has really stood the test of time. Uh, if you're not familiar with the book, it's entitled College Athletes for Hire, The Evolution and Legacy of the NCAA's Amateur Myth. Uh, and it's a seminal contribution to the literature. Yeah, Frank, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, our third person today is a, um, is a young professional, Jared Good, uh, who's at Penn State Law at Penn State University. Uh, and I've gotten to know Jared and his work in my role as managing editor of the sports column. And he's written extensively about a variety of topics, most re recently about the Olympics, Formula One, uh, and of course, college sports in a variety of ways. Thank you for having me. It's a cool experience. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and last but not least, uh, I have something to say personally here. Years ago, um, when I was a graduate student at West Virginia, my wife, Kathy and I, who's also a Mountaineer alum, would go to the old Mountaineer field and we would watch the Mountaineers play football. Uh, lo and behold, now 50 some years later, uh, a number of those players uh, have become my friends. And we uh, are part of this future use series. If you haven't had a chance, would encourage you to go to uh, a video called They Live Their Lives Appropriately 
Uh, and it's the title because how they were influenced, uh, not only on the field by uh, coaches such as Bobby Bowden, who um, became coach of West Virginia in 1970 after the team got a big Peach Bowl win in 1969. But uh, then, of course, uh, Coach Bowden went on to Florida State and had one of the best careers ever in college football. And so we're very pleased to have uh, my friends and colleagues here from uh, West Virginia University. I call them legacy football players. I hope that's uh, the right way, but they can describe it, but they can talk about the way it was and the influence that folks like Coach Bowden had on them. And so let me introduce them in, in turn so you can see them. We'll start with uh, uh, Mickey Plumley. Thank you, Mickey, for being here. Well, thank you for having me, Frank. It's an honor to serve with uh, you folks today and the previous discussions we've had on this subject. I look forward to contributing more today and in the future to see if we can't get some bearings on where we're headed with this. And Mickey lives in uh, Georgia now. And then there is Bob Zatelli from Pittsburgh. Bob. It's a pleasure meeting all of you. And I certainly appreciate you, Frank, getting us together. Um, it's quite thought-provoking uh, thought how things have changed drastically from uh, late 60s and early 70s to where we're at today. Uh, but, you know, I often wonder, um, are we a train wreck trying to get back on track exactly where we're headed? But um, I, I think it'll be a very interesting conversation, um, especially with um, the panel that we have today. Uh, as far as the players are concerned, we got our we have our viewpoints, and I'm sure that uh, Jared, Jason, and Eileen also have theirs. And I'm very very interested uh, to hear what they have to say. Um, so I'm open for discussion, and it's great to see everybody. And, and thank you very much, Frank, for getting us together. Thank you, Bob. Uh, and now Charlie Fisher, we'll go to Charlie. Hey, Frank, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I think, I think this topic has a lot of meaning to all of us. Um, I think a lot of us are sad by the way we see sports going, college sports going. But again, it's, I'm, a, I'm a pleasure to be here and thank you for the invite. And um, hopefully we can all share something that will be meaningful to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Last but not least, our good friend, Dick Roberts. Dick, I'll turn to you. Mike, thank you for having me. And I'm really concerned about the direction we're going. Uh, these young players today will never have what we had in the 60s and the care we had for each other. They're making it a money factor. But when we were teammates, if I had a dime, my teammate had a dime. But now it's all about money and individualism. It's not about the team. And I'm pretty disgusted the direction we're going right now as college athletes, basketball and all of them. Thanks, Dick. Um, we appreciate that. Thank you for being here. Uh, and so let's let's turn to Jason. And I have I want to say, Jason, I have recommended I don't know how many times uh, recommended your article uh, because it's so well written, so accessible. Uh, and so if you could give us an overview of, of what you wrote, um, why you wrote it. Um, uh, and uh, I'm very interested and I'm sure the audience is what the response has been so far. So, Jason, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Frank. I uh, appreciate your interest in the article, and um, I'm in an unusual position here. Usually I find myself uh, asking questions of, of people like this to help inform an article like that. Um, and, uh, and so to, and once I have the answers to those questions, I can sit by myself in a room and write it <laughs> and think about what I have to say rather than, than to speak on it. But so to give you a little background, um, the, the article appeared in what was the uh, kind of 50th anniversary issue of Notre Dame Magazine. Uh, and one of the, the things that we wanted to do with that issue was to take a look at perennial issues that have been covered over the decades in the magazine, um, especially issues like the you know, commercialization of college sports that were particularly live in the moment. Um, and with the name, image, and likeness issues and everything happening in college sports right now was um, in the news, very important current event 
as well as something that had been talked about over the years in different ways um, in the magazine before analyzing and debating the place of commercialized college sports in an academic environment. Um, that's been um, a topic that um, has come up many times over the years. And so that was kind of the background of why we wanted to do it. Um, and as you mentioned before, I came to Notre Dame, I worked at the University of Chicago alumni magazine. And so I've seen from an institutional perspective, two very different models of um, how college sports can work. Uh, both of which I should say, if the institutions will tell you um, fit very comfortably within their academic environment. They're, both of them feel like they have a handle on that tension. Um, but because the, the issues that arise with um, the increasing commercialization um, and new sort of innovations in revenue generation that change the game, change the experience of the players and the coaches, um, these, these issues kind of revive and recur and new controversies come up all the time. Uh, and before I, I was at the University of Chicago, I was a sports reporter and sports editor um, and covering Notre Dame, covering the Big Ten, uh, major college sports was kind of central to, to the work I was doing. And just in my own work, I feel like I've seen over the years um, the, the, these kind of hard limits that were imposed on, you know, we, we cannot take this next step. We've reached the sort of maximized, commercialized potential of college sports and we can't go any farther. And then we take that next step. And then that becomes the ceiling. And then we take the next step and that becomes the ceiling. And so that was kind of the, the idea of kind of looking back at um, how this has happened so many times over the years. I think of things like, um, you know, I think when our West Virginia players here played, the, the regular season was maybe 10 games. Um, you know, the, the Notre Dame National Championship in the 60s that was referenced, I think that was a 10 game regular season. Um, you know, then it went to 11 uh, when people talked about um, maybe bringing a playoff into the, into the college football experience. One of the resistance, one of the arguments against that was that, A, the sort of significance of the regular season, but also too many games. that would be too much of a burden on the players to play 13 or 14 games. Now a team that's going to win the national championship will play 15 games, nearly as many as a professional regular season. Uh, and that's all happened within the last 15 or 20 years, that sort of expansion of the regular season to 11, then the conference championship game is 12, um, and, and it just grows and grows. So that's just one area um, where that's happened. Obviously, a huge component is um, the broadcast rights and broadcast explosion where all the money comes from. Uh, and that's actually a very important part of Notre Dame's athletic history, um, dating back literally to Newt Rockne, um, who invited sports radio broadcasters into the into the press box essentially whoever could fill the space was welcome and he helped build this kind of national audience for Notre Dame with the foresight of at that point not selling the rights offering this offering the seat to somebody to to do it and um, uh, Murray Sperber is a historian who's written extensively and and fascinatingly about this is um, the history of that and even in, in the 1950s um, Notre Dame's athletic leaders. Uh, you mentioned a, a book I wrote about Moose Krause. Uh, Moose Krause and Father Ned Joyce, who was the executive vice president during the, the Hesburgh years at Notre Dame, who was really the, the person in charge of athletics, they were at the forefront of arguing for loosening the NCAA's restriction on television rights. Um, and as you can imagine, Notre Dame, with its national following, wanted the money that it could make from uh, selling its broadcast rights, but the NCAA in those days, in the 1950s, and before and for some years after, um, restricted that uh, with the idea that it was important for competitive balance, uh, perhaps even the idea that the commercialization might go too far if, um, if those kind of uh, fetters were taken off. Uh, but Notre Dame, as far back as at least the 1950s, was using rather, um, you know, uh, um, inflamed language to call, calling the NCAA's policies communistic. I mean, imagine saying that in the 1950s and how people would, would understand that. Um, and so then of course, once those um, um, restrictions were removed, we know where we stand today, where Notre Dame has its own national television contract and has for, for 30 years. Um, conferences have their own networks, um, deals with ESPN you know, that, that reach into the billions. Um, and so all of that 
has, you know, as, as everybody here, I think knows very well, um, has inflated the pressure, inflated the salaries for coaches. Um, and then that trickles down to, you know, inflate the pressure that athletes face. Um, and so the sort of the, the next line that can't be crossed as the um, article was, was headlined um, was this most recent sort of development that people have been arguing for really for years that in this environment, the, the people who are generating this revenue effectively, the players who are the, you know, the product, if we want to use the commercialization term, that uh, fans are tuning into that is that are raising all this money are seeing none of it and are um, deliberately prevented from receiving any of it. Um, and as the I think as the um, commercialization increased, as the money increased, as the pressure increased, as the number of games increased, as the um, you know the timing of the games, the demands on them uh, that extended into the off season far beyond what um, you know players of, of a couple of generations ago faced, um, it became at some level kind of untenable that players weren't seeing any of this. Um, as, a, as a sports writer myself, there, there always seemed to be an arbitrary line that, you know, there was, I, I didn't understand long ago why a student could work at a job on campus um, and get paid for that job and not have their sort of status as a student, their relationship to the university change or there, you know, I, I was a, a, worked for the student newspaper and for the local newspaper when I was in college, got paid by both places. Um, and my status from amateur to professional didn't change. Nobody confused me with a professional when I was a college student freelancing for the local newspaper. Um, and obviously I was making, you know, beer money, trivial money compared to what, um, you know, an athlete might be worth on the, on the open market. Uh, but it seemed like uh, an arbitrary line that was based on the amount of money, not the sort of nature of the relationship between the student and the institution. Um, so that's kind of it, you know, in the back of my mind over the years, and that's not an original idea. There, there, you know, have been many people who have been advocating for this. There have been lawsuits filed. There have been, you know, many, many ways that uh, people have tried to, you know, open the doors to have athletes receive some share of, of you know, the, the revenue that they generate. Um, and all of that, of course, just is an uncomfortable fit in an academic environment because first and foremost, they're students. Um, and so how does their um, athletic experience compromise that? Um, and even in places, I think, you know, there's, there's often discussion about the, the um, impact on education or the idea that athletes aren't getting the education they should. And I, I think that's you know, certainly can be true. But I also think even in places where um, that the emphasis is on education first, or, you know, as a, as a primary component of the reason they're there, the, the nature of what they're here to do as athletes, in the, specifically in the revenue producing sports, football, men's and women's basketball, where there's, um, you know, just a huge amount of attention and interest in what they're doing. Um, it's, it's not hard to Put yourself in their position and and think yeah i think my test in chemistry tomorrow is not going to matter as much as my nationally televised basketball game tonight that i'm going to be you know um criticized for on social media that you know millions of people are going to watch um and that you know everybody in my life is going to be talking about much more than than anything else i'm doing and there's also the factor that um you know ac athletic careers have a short shelf life and there is for football and, and men's basketball players, particularly and even some women's basketball players now, um, you know, a huge potential um, uh, payoff that could come beyond college, even though that happens to a vanishingly small percentage of them. Um, that's that if they have a chance for it, that chance is now and the chance for the educational aspect of it will come later. Right now, there's a story that's been a feel good story here at Notre Dame uh, this semester um, Jerome Bettis, who's a Hall of Fame uh, NFL running back, uh, Super Bowl champion, was a star here at Notre Dame in the early 1990s, is back now finishing his degree. Um, you know, but his career, the, the shelf life that he had for his athletic career happened 30 years ago and sort of needed to be and understandably was uh, the focus. Um, but what that creates, of course, is this tension that we're talking about. And as it balloons, um, 
to you know amounts of money that um, most of us cannot fathom, um, that tension only is greater. And as as you noted, Frank, there's a, a moment in the the story that I wrote where um, unexpectedly, as the story was going to press, um, Notre Dame needed a new football coach, um, and we didn't see that coming. But it was kind of a, a well timed given the subject of the of the story because it was another moment of um, money seemingly trumping everything in sports. And at Notre Dame, uh, if any of you know the sort of feeling that Notre Dame fans have for the program, for the, the, the place, um, someone leaving Notre Dame to go coach somewhere else, uh, no matter, you know, the, the idea that there is an amount of money that would make that possible is, you know, there's the Notre Dame fan base doesn't understand that there's an amount of money that's possible to make that, to go somewhere other than Notre Dame. So it was a huge uproar here. Um, but he was also one of at least a couple of coaches who went from one sort of blue blood program to another Lincoln Riley going from Oklahoma to Notre Dame's big rival USC um, that sort of re-upped all this conversation. Um, then players were leaving to follow coaches uh, and then all this sort of revolving door situation. Where's, where did the academics fit into this? And there was a, a comment from the Notre Dame athletic director, Jack Swarbrick in the article, he was asked about this um, when he was addressing the media about the coaching change. Um, and so it, it, the question was broadly just kind of like, what, is, what does this mean these coaches leaving in, in, uh, for the big paydays from one program to another? And the answer was, you know, I don't know, it's too soon to say, but we need to take a look at what it means to fit um, athletics into an academic environment, this high profile athletics. Um, and then I think the other, the other piece of that is, so that's, that's the tension that's been going on for decades that is increasing now. And the other piece of that is the next step for Jack Swarbrick in that situation was to go find the next coach and to make sure that that next coach um, was going to be competing for a national championship. So it wasn't that, okay, we've reached a point of no return and we have to step back. It was now we're still a part of this environment and how do we find a way to either maintain our place in it or continue to, to succeed as we're competing against um, programs who are, are dealing with the same competitive forces, the same economic forces. Um, and so that's um, a long-winded way of, of saying what I, I tried to say in the article that over the years, these um, lines have been crossed that have seemed like they were going to have um, some kind of impact. Either we've gone too far and now we have to scale back. Um, that hasn't happened along the way. Um, now that players are getting some piece of that, that seems that idea seems to be increasing again. You mentioned reaction. I think I hear a fair amount of reaction about you know players getting money that that makes people uncomfortable. Um, and like I said, for me, I, I, I don't feel uncomfortable about that. It feels like the natural next step. If anything, I, in my personal feeling is that it's not another line that's been crossed. It's that it's the natural extension of all the previous lines that have been crossed. They, the players have just been invited across the line um, where to my mind, they maybe belonged a long time ago. Uh, so I don't know, uh, they, there's, um, you know, many other factors with this and, and, our, our sports law expert in particular might be able to help us with what, what could happen once, if ever, athletes become, you know, paid by the university as opposed to um, receiving name, image, and likeness money from external sources, given all the Title IX implications that could be there, the, you know, um, issues with liability for injuries and things that might come into play uh, when that happens, but, or if that happens. Um, but, you know, the, the landscape as I see it today is not a, not a drastic change in this new situation other than um, maybe a, a past wrong has been righted a little bit to give players some share in what they have helped produce. Thank you very much. And for those that uh, are watching, uh, the title of the article, of uh, Jason's article, is The Next with Next in parentheses, Line That Can't Be Crossed. And it's in the winter 2021-22 edition of the Notre Dame magazine. And it's very easy to Google and, and pull it up. And as I've mentioned, I've re recommended it to a number of people and gotten very positive comments. Thank you very much. Um, Ellen, you have studied, uh, written, uh, consulted uh, over, over the years on what we've been talking about here, your informed perspective, 
uh, very important to this conversation. So let me turn to you for your thoughts. Thanks so much, Frank. And um, thank you for including me in this conversation with this group of people. And Jason, I join you um, in terms of really having this wish to be on the interviewer side of things, um, because I'm chomping at the bit to really hear from our former players about their perspectives. Um, and I'm gonna humbly set out a couple of big ideas to think about um, that actually in some ways might upend or challenge the, the way that we've been framing how we talk about the commercial interest of college sport. Um, and Frank, when I got your email inviting me to participate and I saw that the title of this was Crossing the Line, um, I, was, I was excited when I saw that, uh, that, that term um, because uh, for a long time now, I've been thinking, well, where, where, where have we developed this sensibility that we have crossed some line? And what, what does that actually mean? And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some big historical pieces, and then, uh, then I'm gonna um, connect it to um, kind of the moving train that I think we're on now. Um, if, if we go back and we look at what was happening in the 1950s in terms of the NCAA, the NCAA had just formalized its bureaucracy. It moved to a situation where it had its first full-time executive director uh, in the person of Walter Byers, who was a media person. Walter Byers was given the latitude to negotiate the television rights for college football from the NCAA. So, at that time, as they started to talk about this idea around a, what, what has been repeated over and over and over again, and is in the NCAA manual, about a clear line of demarcation between professional and college sport, I wonder now if we really misunderstand what was actually happening when that expression was embedded in the manual for this reason, that in addition to all of the other things that we talk about in terms of athletic and um, academic eligibility, there was a robust conversation that was going on around college football's relationship to professional football. Um, Professional football was just beginning to experiment with television as well. In, in the mid 1950s, the NCAA made a mistake from the standpoint that they were too conservative in the way that they were negotiating their television rights. And they were beginning to feel the pressure of that. Professional football was beginning to come into the market. They were, they were much more free, free flowing in terms of the television um, contracts that they were engaging with. Um, and so, so the NCAA, they could feel that college football was being left behind. Um, and there was also this issue of managing player personnel because um, college football players were being poached um, out of the college ranks to play at the professional ranks. So, so, so in, in, in going back and really looking at that and really looking at, looking at this terminology about a clear line of demarcation between college and professional sports, that has oftentimes been used to, um, to get us to think about just sort of protecting this academic space. When in point of fact, um, and I think coming through to the Supreme Court ruling um, uh, last, last summer, um, uh, where, where amateurism was found to be a myth, that I, I think that, that that clear line of demarcation has to do with market. It has to do with market position. Um, and then if we, if we follow that logic out, and ho hopefully I'm, I'm explaining this well enough so you can follow along with me, but it, it's been interesting, especially in court rulings, where we've had this reference to college football and college basketball as being the minor leagues. And of course, at, at some level, that's true, right? Because we, we, we've got training grounds for the professional ranks. 
Um, so, so the logic of that holds up to a point because college football, men's basketball and women's basketball are not minor leagues within a multi-billion dollar sport and entertainment industry. We don't have dedicated television um, networks. We don't have 24 seven coverage of minor leagues. We have 24 seven coverage of major players in this global sport and entertainment marketplace. And that's the market that we're in when we're talking about college football, men's basketball and women's basketball. We're talking on a global sport and, uh, sport and entertainment industry. And the, the reason why I think that's so important for us to understand in the present is that, um, that, that we, we have an intersection between higher education and commerce, um, which has always been there. Um, you know, and, and, and college, college sport has been incredibly important in terms of positioning institutions of higher education relative to recruiting student bodies, relative to um, uh, getting their message out in the public domain, relative to um, them being able to make their case with state legislatures. Um, it, you know, uh, Derek Bach, um, the president at Harvard has been credited with referring to college sport as the front porch of the university. Um, and, and frankly, also one of the players, the, the college sport being one of the players in the commercialization of higher education overall. Um, so to me, that's an important big picture thing for us to think about. In the 1990s, that picture gets reinforced when Miles Brand takes over as president of the NCAA, because the framing was, it's perfectly all right to encourage all manner of commercialism in college sport. It's perfectly okay for commercial aspects of college sport to just roll on unabated. There's a distinction between making money and commercial interests versus maintaining college athletes as amateurs. That framework was put into place in the 1990s. And so effectively, it pulled all the reins off of the, the, the commercial um, parts of the enterprise and said, go after it as much as you want, but we're going to keep the players as quote unquote amateur, okay? Um, and, and of course, I think we're dealing with what the reality of all of that is now, um, and, and, and frankly has been for a long time. Um, in this name, image, and likeness era, we've heard people say that this is a reform era. Um, and I, 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 would, I would disagree with that. I don't think that this is about reform. Um, I think it's about restoration. College athletes in the early 1900s had access to endorsing products. It was NCAA rules that blocked them from having that fundamental economic right. Um, and, and frankly, that, that rule about athletes not endorsing products um, was only disrupted because state legislators intervened and said, athletes are citizens they, have, they, they should have the rights of any other citizen in our state, um, and they should have the opportunity to be able to benefit from their name, image, and likeness. So I, I, don't, see, I don't see that conversation as being one about reform. I see it as one about restoration of a fundamental economic right. Um, building, building off of that, the NCAA has known always when they created the athletic scholarship in the 1950s, when they codified it, the language in the 1950s of the people who were passing that legislation, interestingly enough, is that they knew that they had created a pay for play system. That was the language that they were using at that time. And, they, and, and um, Fritz Chrysler, for example, the athletic director at the University of Michigan, as he was looking at what was happening there, 
and I'm paraphrasing his quote, but, but, but effectively he said, what we are doing as a system is we are reserving our rights as a college sports system to professionalize athletes the way that we want to, the way that we want to. So that, that's how he understood that economic control associated with the athletic scholarship. Um, and we see that in terms of the NCAA manual. For example, one would think that if there was, had been a commitment to amateurism, meaning that, 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 that people play for the love of the game and not for any kind of pay, then, then, then you would think that in that manual, all 500 pages of it plus, you would think somewhere in that manual, there would be a statement to that effect but there is no such statement. Um, there's a definition that says that, that the way that the NCAA defines pay is the NCAA defines pay as anything that it does not wish to pay out. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a very different, that's a very different take than the saying, We're gonna, um, we, we want you to play for the love of the game. Um, what they, th th this is about economic control. Um, and so, so I think what we've come to, you know, in this moment is we, ha we have a narrative, we have a, a long time narrative, um, along, with, um, along with a change in culture, with a dramatic change in culture, where sports nation today is very, very different than what it was in 1950s, 1960s, all the way up and down the chain, because our youth sports system is a $15 billion industry in and of itself. Um, long before athletes ever get recruited to college, their exposure from age five, age four on is, is much, much different. And the economic investment is much, much, much different than, than what it was in the 50s and 60s. And so that's also feeding into the kind of this question of, well, how do we deal with this behemoth now? Um, because we're not just talking about, about college sport, we're talking about college sport being part of this much larger um, economic um, and media structure overall. Um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll close my remarks for right now because I, I really want to hear from everybody else here. But, um, but I will I will say this one thing, or or I would just kind of maybe encourage us maybe to think about this a slightly different way in terms of uh, the fit relative to whether or not whether or not we could see our way clear in higher education and be comfortable with having athletes as employees um, and, and how that, whether, whether or not that really is an uncomfortable fit. And, and the reason why, why I raise the point, higher education has always had employees who have pursued their academic degrees, always. They've had graduate assistants who've pursued their degrees They've had people who are working on campus and as undergraduates who have pursued their degrees. Um, you know, I was working at Drexel. I got a second master's degree from the law school there. Um, uh, you know, I was working full time, but I had, I had access to a degree program. So, so, I, so we have employees at universities who are, who are getting paid who also are earning their degrees. And, and what I would argue because, and for those of you who don't know me very well on the call, it, it's important that you understand this. I, I, I am an advocate for athletes to be, to be employees. I also am an advocate for um, a player's association. But the, 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 the reason why I think that framework could be helpful here is that I think that it would help to create a new structure that recognizes um, the magnitude of what we've got here um, and, and, that, and that places the value. It, it, all of our conversations about employment get lost sort of in this idea that this is all about a paycheck. Rarely in employment are things just solely about a paycheck. 
Um, it's about health and safety issues. It's about professional development. It's quality of life. It's control over supervision. It's how many hours a week you're working and under what circumstances. Um, and so, so in some ways, um, to me, an employment framework might actually help to clean things up in a way to which, so, so that it doesn't feel like, um, like we're spinning off so far away from mission. It might actually help to um, resolve these issues that have created perennial problems that we can't figure out. Um, so I'll dismount. I'll dismount on that um, and really look forward to hearing what, what the others think about this um, or whether or not I'll get voted off the island. Um, so um, thank you. Thank you for listening to me. No, thank you. Thank you. Those of you who may not know Eleanor work, you now know why I was thrilled when she said she would join us today. That historical perspective is so important. And, and you mentioned Walter Byers. Um, reading his autobiography written shortly before he died, entitled Unsportsmanlike Conduct, is an incredible experience. But thank you for reframing uh, and using history really to, to move us into a reframing mode. Uh, certainly helpful to me and I'm sure to others as well. Uh, Jared, I know we're running up against the clock in terms of your class. I hope you can stay a little bit longer. Um, to get your perspective, not only as a law student, uh, someone who thinks about this and writes about this and would like to make a career of it, but as you look at it as a Penn State law student, please share your thoughts. Um, I'm much more pessimistic about the NCAA as a whole. I feel that they have operated for decades as a cartel in violation of basically every antitrust law imaginable at this point, but given that they have been so intent on reigning in the power of athletes and be able to control basically every aspect of financial incentivize, incentivization that comes into the schools. I really believe that this is kind of their, for lack of a better word, karma, and they're receiving what they've sown for so long. Basically, if you look back at the historical underpinnings of the NCAA over the last probably 40-ish years, given any time that they are taken to court, they've really been losing control of anything outside of what they have been wanting to make sure they hold on to. Really basically starting with uh, you, NCAA versus the Board of Regents of Oklahoma and Georgia, which pretty much ruined any chance that they had to control how schools and conferences were able to dictate how they could market different games and how they would follow the NCAA practices of only allowing one or two games per school to be broadcasted per season in any of the sports. And that was right there was a really big loss. And that I believe is kind of where you can look at the trajectory and see that the NCAA is kind of starting to dwindle down. So, and if you can follow that, it, the NCAA has really been falling till then, mostly because it's not unheard of, and I mean, it's certainly not a secret that athletes have been getting paid by colleges for pretty much as long as any of us really want to admit, and that's always kind of been the name of the game. Look how many teams were sanctioned and have given massive academic scandals going back from the 80s on of people being paid and compensated for what was otherwise a pretty standard NCAA violation. So I believe that now that athletes actually can just profit off of their name injury like this, and they're much more empowered to do so, it really helps to get rid of the need for the central bureaucracy of the NCAA because they're the most inept board of governors I've ever seen. Like they're so, honestly, they're pretty useless most of the time and anything they do is just pretty much routinely hated by not only fans, but the athletes themselves, just simply because they don't really understand the nature of sports in general. And they think that everything has to be so dictated to a point that it almost ruins the reason that people want to participate. And so I think it's going to be really interesting as we go through in the next few years, as there's a lot of athletes already that are banding together to try to file for unionization. Now that since last year's Austin case came down, and Kavanaugh left open the door for people to actually 
specifically sue the NCAA on antitrust grounds and open the door for NLO, NLRB recommendation of unions that we're going to have a pretty interesting time in seeing how not only the courts are going to address this, given that they're still trying to balance the idea of amateurism, amateurism, even though they pretty much have said that it's not really a thing. They have to balance that against the interests of not only athletes, but the schools, because given the new constitutional changes to the NCAA, we're going more towards a strictly the conferences and the schools themselves are going to be able to decide how they want to move forward with their sporting programs simply because they're going to actually have the power now to, and it's not going to be held directly to the NCAA. So it's going to be a really unique and different time. I do definitely believe that given the current system, we need some type of more concrete and uniform legislation because a lot of the NLL, NIL rights right now are just so ridiculously dominated by only a few huge schools and they are able to rake in tons of money with students and so that really incentivizes the whole pay to play because if you look at a school like Texas A&M they just got the number one recruiting class but they are just not that good they're a pretty <laughs> average college football team but they have a massive donor network and they have huge pockets of money and opportunities for students to come in and profit off their NIL rights that they can draw on people on the quality of an Alabama or a Georgia or Ohio State teams that have actually proven that they can win at the highest level and have done it. And then on top of that, given the fact that Congress is about as useless as the NCAA on most things, it's going to, we're going to have a long time of trying to figure out how this is going to go because we're never going to find a really good common ground until we have more and more history to look back on and how the NIL rights are going to be dictated. For example, if you look at Quinn Ewers, he was the number one recruit last year for Ohio State. He didn't play a single down during the season, but he was able to profit $1.4 million on his NIL rights, and then he left and transferred to Texas. He didn't play at all at Ohio State. And stuff like that, I just it shows that that yes, it's good that we need this type of stuff because the NCAA has just been so aggressively monopolistic, but it needs to be not fixed, but just altered at least to more effectively combat issues of equity and different gender-based issues of how, and not only that, but just in like non-revenue sports. So, I mean, I don't want to be that person. Like I understand it from an economic sense because who's going to go and pay someone who's a swimmer that somebody doesn't know or play or pay the quarterback of the number five team in FBS who's always competing for the championship. So it's going to be an interesting development over the next few years. There's not really much that we can determine at this very point because it's still a very fluid situation on how it's being approached and what we can do at the moment. But like I said, in the next few years, we're going to get more of a sense on how things are going to be changed and what we're looking at in terms of an actual concrete system to be put in place. Thank you very much, uh, Jared. Appreciate that. You know, I was thinking as you were talking and also reflecting on uh, Ellen's and, and uh, Jason's presentation is that um, when I first read the headline the other day, I, my head shot back that the NCAA is now investigating the NIL system, if you want to call it a system. Uh, but then I said, well, wait a minute now. It was not a system that the NCAA uh, initiated or even wanted. It came through state legislature, legislatures. And uh, then I read about the what the NCAA did recently in terms of reconstituting itself, a new constitution uh, that went down significantly in size that essentially devolves more and more authority to the to the conferences in schools, maybe, I'm not an attorney, to make them less vulnerable to lawsuits. Um, and, and Ellen, your point is, uh, and it is counterintuitive to a lot of folks, I think, but I think it makes a lot of sense, that, that the question that used to be raised, are these athletes uh, employees? 
now has gone from inquisitive to declarative. Uh, they really are. If you look at their functions and the time spent, they are employees. With NIL, who's paying them? Companies. Employees, who pays employees? The universities, that's the issue I think that is important to look at. One issue in the conferences. Um, are we going to get to a point, Jared, as you talk about how inter interesting it's going to be for colleges and universities and conferences to divide their pie? their pie so that all the money that they generate uh, beyond the, the money that goes to, to um, uh, scholarships where they, they really view these players as employees and compensate them accordingly so that it's in their budget. Fascinating, no question. Thank you, Jared. I know you're gonna have to run to class. We kept you a little bit uh, later, but thank you so much for being here. Let's turn to uh, our, our, our legacy players, uh, and we'll start with uh, Mickey Plumley. Your thoughts, uh, I was watching you, and I know that you've been listening intently, and you think about these larger issues anyway. So uh, your thoughts, Mickey, and then we'll, we'll uh, turn to the other players. Well, thank you again, Frank, for having me as part of this panel today, along with my uh, teammates, the other legacy players here that Good to see them on our uh, Zoom meeting here today. We've always had a uh, an affinity, a love for each other that was fostered from the type of atmosphere that we had the capability of playing in back in the late 1960s, the early 1970s. You know, back in those days, uh, we were honored to have the opportunity to represent our state, represent our university. It was really a privilege to be given an athletic scholarship. And it was an era in which uh, we felt we were fortunate to be able to do that at the amateur level, to have the opportunity to come together and I dare say that most of us, I know for myself, uh, would not have had the opportunity to pursue a higher education without an athletic scholarship. And I dare say that was true for most of us uh, back in the 1960s. So, you know, the, the era in which we played was uh, under a, a dome, an atmosphere that was created by some great men, uh, college coaches in uh, football history at the NCAA level, uh, Jim Carlin and Bobby Bowden in particular. And when they brought us into West Virginia University, uh, we were paid, just as people are paid today, we were paid $20 a month because the training table was closed on Sunday evenings and we had to go out and buy our dinner on Sunday nights. So to compare that to what's going on today, uh, I say that in jest because the, the great thing about playing at the collegiate level back in the day was it was a purely amateur athletic competition. And my biggest concern about what's happened with NIL and corporate sponsorships of colleges and universities is it destroys, in my mind, the purity of athletic competition for athletic competition's sake. It's, it's kind of like Jim Thorpe back in the Olympics, if you remember the great athlete Jim Thorpe that won numerous gold medals, and then they were stripped from him a few years later when it was discovered that he was paid a, a paltry sum for doing a, a minor advertisement for a company. We didn't play for the money, Frank. We didn't play for the opportunity of going on to the NFL. We played to represent our state. We played for the love that we had for each other. And we played as a team. And the other concern I have about that line that we're crossing is the fact that uh, the, the economics of the situation work to undermine 
that entire moralistic view of, you know, why you're playing this sport. You're playing it because you love the game or are you playing it because you think you might get an NFL contract one of these days? Are you playing for your teammates and for the love and concern you have for them? Or are you playing for yourself and the NIL contract that you might personally stand to receive? So the entire atmosphere, I have a big problem with. Uh, and as Ellen uh, said, there should be a clear line between pure uh, amateur athletic competition and professional competition. And what's happening, the way I see things today, is that line is being blurred greatly by NIL, by corporate sponsorships. And, you know, the moralistic value of, of the purity of the sport is greatly impacted, I think, by betting services and gambling services actively sponsoring universities. And I think Michigan State was a good example of that, Frank. I know you've told me a story of what's happened there. And it's happening all across the country. And I have a great concern about where all this is headed. Uh, for us, back in the day, it was a privilege. And now most young men who come into an athletic uh, environment like that are privileged. They feel like they're entitled to making this money, to being compensated economically for uh, having some athletic ability. And I, I have a big problem with it. I will continue to, that line, I think it's already been crossed and, and will continue to be crossed in the future unless something happens to turn it all around. A couple of examples I'll give here quickly uh, to Jason's point about the NCAA back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s and following up on what Ellen had to say. I'll never forget uh, Brian Bosworth, who was a linebacker for Oklahoma. That's one of the first players that ever came out actively against the NCAA. And I'll never forget tonight, I forget who they were playing on TV, but he came out, you may recall this, and he had a temporary jersey that he had made. They put over his Oklahoma jersey that said NCAA, the National Communist Athletic Association. <laughs> so Brian was one of the first people that recognized, you know, what rights did the NCAA have to determine whether or not individual athletes should be compensated for their participation or not? So you go back, you go from that and are getting $20, you know, a month to pay for a Sunday evening dinner to, to give an example, the University of Texas alumni just started a uh, nonprofit organization called the Pancake Club. And they are giving any offensive lineman that signs a contract with the University of Texas $50,000 each and every year that they stay at the University of Texas and play for the Longhorns. Now, obviously, they're doing that in preparation for their entree, along with Oklahoma, into the SEC conference. And to give you another example of how the economics of all this situation blur what, again, I call the purity of the amateur athletic competition. The SEC itself, you know, that organization, they have signed, I'm sure you've heard of the SEC television network. Do you know that every school in the SEC, every, yeah, every active member of the SEC in both East and West Conference, on average gets $67 million a year from the SEC Network's television broadcast rights. Oklahoma and Texas's entree in the SEC is going to increase that due to their television and advertising markets in those two states from $67 million a, a team to $107 million per team per year. So my concern is that every decision that's made today is made on the economics of the situation. It's made on the business aspects of it. And the shame in that situation for me is, I think I'm right on this statistics. If you look back over the past 30 years, one third of 1% of college athletes have made it on to the professional level. So we've got all this going on for a very, very minute, small percent of participants who'll ever end up being rewarded from it. 
if we're going to do it, in my opinion, what we should do it, again, back to Ellen and Jason's points, is let's face it, the collegiate athletic system, both for basketball and for football and probably some other sports, soccer, one I can think of, are really training teams. They're uh, field teams for national uh, paid teams in the NFL and the NBA and the uh, MLS Soccer Association. So if we're going to do this, let's make it equitable to everybody across the board and let's have the teams in the uh, professional arena that are going to benefit from these individual services, have them underwrite it on a basis of equality to every school in America. Because again, one of my concerns, and I'll end with this, is you know, where does the approach that we're taking today lead us in terms of a school like Texas being able to offer their offensive linemen $50,000 a year to come play for them versus a team like Northern Illinois that has always had very uh, aggressive and competitive teams, but clearly would not have the economic ability to match something like that. Even West Virginia University, our alma mater, has formed an organization now that's headed up by the owner of the Arizona Diamondbacks baseball team, along with uh, Jerry West and Oliver Buck and some other prominent West Virginians who have the economic uh, ability to allow West Virginia to compete uh, with the Big 12 schools and the SEC schools. And... I really hate to have gotten to that point, quite frankly, uh, because it, again, in my mind, destroys uh, what we played for, the love of each other, the love of our state, and the love of our schools. Thank you very much, Mickey. I was going to think as you're, you said so much there, but one um, sort of footnote, uh, Brian Bosworth, uh, for those who don't know, he's now featured as the sheriff in the Dr. Pepper commercials that you've been seeing. That's, oh, that's right. Brian Bosworth. Yeah. How about that? So he's still there. That's right. <laughs> yeah, but uh, well, so thanks well. for listening. I want to I want to thank everyone for their contribution here today. It's been uh, it's been an honor to be part of the panel and to listen to these other opinions. And I can't wait to hear what my teammates have to say. Now. Yeah, and thank you for your perspective as always, Bob. We're going to turn to you up in Pittsburgh. Oh, uh, Ellen, uh, Ellen, I just want to say something to Ellen. Said Ellen. If you were around when we were playing college football, I would be knocking on your door to find out what our fundamental economic freedom would be as West Virginia universities for my brothers and sisters that played ball and participated there. Uh, my background over 38 years, uh, retired uh, International Brotherhood of Boilermakers, Local Union 154 in Pittsburgh. And um, I did some field work for the international on some very tough conditions, uh, trying to organize workers' rights. So I have a very deep affinity and respect for what you're doing, Alan, and I certainly appreciate that. Um, you know, for years, he said, we could go back and reflect back to when we were playing college ball, but um, the thought, I would say the thought probably always crossed our mind, what am I gonna do with that $20 bill? And probably in most cases, it probably got us an extra couple of quarts of beer and a pizza. So, but we did, but we did get that. We did get that twenty. Um, college sports today. I look, I look at kids, uh, particularly in Western Pennsylvania. We have a very rich uh, tradition of of, of hard nosed football players because you know we're, we're we're always viewed as well. You got your lunch bucket. It's time to go to work. Blue collar. So over time, the, the uh, Student athletes in our communities are, are very, very uh, appreciative for the opportunity to have an athletic scholarship. But fortunately, uh, my background, we had some great um, mentors, some coaches, counselors who kept us focused on why, you're, why you have an opportunity to get an education was to make the most of it because your time frame after athletics is reality sets in. And it's very important that you stay focused on your academics. Um, at West Virginia University, 
the academic support was there, it was up to us to take advantage of that situation for tutoring and study halls and so forth, uh, for which I know my teammates are grateful for. I think that the um, commercialization of the game, uh, they have a good, good hard look at it. Um, I certainly hope that the um, collegiate association, and I, I often wonder the perception of using words such as association, organization, and union have different connotations with the American public. Um, I think as human beings, we kind of look at things and evaluate things and, and say, most cases say that we evaluate things based on our own personal limitations. I don't know what the limitations are for these players. Um, I know what the limitations are for the universities and the NCAA. It's to keep pushing more and more um, for the revenue sports to create even more revenue for the universities. Uh, the players and the, um, the athletes are on the bottom rung of the ladder. Um, I don't blame these, these athletes today for taking advantage to the NIL. Um, they have a right to do it. And some of them are capitalizing. Um, I'm not too fond of what happened with the Ohio State athlete. I think he was a very shrewd individual. Got his 1.4 mil and he booked for Texas. So let's see how much he works the Longhorns for. Um, anyway, um, I know we're getting down to our limit. I just, I just hope we get a grip on things. Uh, I love my, my teammates. Uh, I wouldn't have traded for the world, having the opportunity to play for Coach Biden and Coach Carlin. And those things that we learned, those values that we learned as young men have certainly carried over into our lives, our families, and our continued relationships with one another after a period of over 50 years. But thank you, Frank. Thank you, Jason, I, Ellen, and uh, also Jared for enlightening me and opening up my eyes a little bit further. Thank you very much. Very thoughtful as, as always, Bob. Appreciate it very much. As you were talking, I was thinking about as, I, as we move on to Charlie Fisher here, when Charlie and I were talking to get ready for this program, he made the comment, which I thought about a lot, uh, something along the lines, Charlie, that if there's anything that we should know as 70-year-old people is that things never stay the same and they always change. And uh, uh, how do we adjust uh, to the circumstances that are, you know, the new reality context? And that's a very thoughtful thing to say. But let me turn to you for your comments. Hey, guys and, and ladies. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and... Um, everything has just been really, really interesting um, to reiterate some of the things that Bob and Mickey have said. Um, we played in a different era and, and it was, it was camaraderie. It was love for the state. It was, um, it was for the love of the game. Uh, Mickey talked about, Bob talked about the 20 bucks. If you break that down, we got $5 a week. And Bob said, Bob said a quart of beer and a, uh, and a pizza. And I can remember going over to Kentucky Fried Chicken and getting my dinner every Sunday night with that five bucks. So things have definitely changed. Um, but I think I can remember Joe Paterna back in the, probably the late 80s was the first head coach that came out and really started talking about compensation for players. And we all thought he was kind of crazy. But when you break it down, I worked for at and I worked a 40 hour week. If I worked over 40 hours, I got time and a half. You know, we put in more than 40 hours a week back then. Um, these players today are doing a 24 seven, 365. Do they, do they, and are they entitled? This is the question to some of the money that the NCAA is making. In all fairness to them, for their time and effort, yes. Now, for us, for us, you know, I couldn't comprehend um, getting paid, you know. And if I was getting paid, would I have been playing for the love of the game or would it have been money and to play on Sunday? You know, when we played out of the 22 players, 11 on offense and 11 on defense, 
75% of those 22 players knew they weren't going to play on Sunday. So we had to play for the love of the game. That's what it was all about, the love of our state, to get a college education. And so is there, is there an answer? There's definitely no quick fix. But, but I do feel that these guys need to be compensated. Something's got to be worked out. And I tell you what bothers me more about college athletics now, as much as, if not more than the money, and I think is, is, is messing up the college sport more than anything, is this transfer portal. And I think that's going to, I think that's going to kill college football for schools like West Virginia, Duke, North Carolina, some of these schools, because the portal's just going to kill it. The portal's going to kill it. But um, I don't think there is a quick fix to this. But my honest opinion is I, I feel that they need, for the amount of time that they spend to play on Sunday or to think that they're going to play on Sunday, I think they do need to get compensated. I'm only grateful for one thing. I'm glad that I played in the era I did. Because, again, it all boiled down to playing with my teammates, the love of the game, the love of my university, and the coaches that I got the chance to play for. But uh, Jason, Jared, Ellen, thank you all. Frank, thank you. Uh, Mick, Bob, Dick, great to see you. And uh, I'll turn this over to Dickie. Frank, thank you, sir. Thank you very, as always, Charlie. Thank you so much. As we turn to, to Dick, you know, I think about, you know, the conversations we've had. Uh, that it certainly includes the love you have for your fellow players. And that wasn't just then, but it's continued to this day. But also uh, following up on what Mickey and, and uh, Charlie and Bob have said, sort of the dual role of, of these coaches is both professors, professor-like, uh, and also father figure-like. I mean, Mickey shared uh, with me the percentage over the years. What was it, Mickey? The percentage over the years of players that Bobby Bowden had at West Virginia and Florida State that came from one parent household? 76%, 76%, 76%. Incredible. Came Incredible. from single parent families. And he became a, a father figure, a lifelong father figure. Incredible. Frank, the only thing I really have to say is these kids today are young men will not experience the love of their teammates that we had. They'll be looking to the next year, how will I benefit myself financially? They won't be contacting each other like we do uh, for the last 52 years. Uh, they're going to lose out on a whole lot. And there's no uniformity in the amount of money they get. Us poor offensive linemen, we would still get our chicken dinners while, while the quarterback would get surf and turf. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're, they need to be paid, but each person needs to be paid equally. Each teammate, uh, because this can be a, a period of dissension uh, among the, the players is, you know, I, I can't have a car because I don't have enough money. Uh, but then the quarterbacks, driving a, Cor a Corvette and it will divide a team and nothing, it could have divided us, but we were all poor at that point in time. So if we had a dime there, well, if we had $5 a drink of beer, we'd, we'd all have a beer. <laughs> okay. But I don't see that happening today. And I'm getting disgusted. Just like Charlie said, at the trans uh, transport for a portal where a kid can play one year at West Virginia University and work out to a four star where they've really worked hard with him and put their time and efforts. Then the next year he could transfer to an Ohio State or Texas and get more money. That is really going to hurt college footballs. I have lost my interest in college footballs because of what is going on now. Uh, I will still watch the game, but not with the enthusiasm I did 
before all this money got involved in. I hope the best for the NCAA because they rode a horse for a long time and they, they had big high salaries and the athletes were not getting paid that much or were getting $5 a week for their Sunday dinner. And the NCAA officials were getting hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, and the coaches, Coach Bob Bowden, when he went to Florida State, he got $35,500 for his contract from what I read. And now you have these college coaches that are making $9 million a year. That's wrong, too. That's very wrong. It needs – the line has crossed. And I don't know when it's going to quit. But, I, Frank, I thank you. I think you're going in the right direction. Maybe you will open up the general public's eye. And we will about how we feel about the situation. I, I appreciate being on. I've heard a lot of good conversation. They need to be paid for their time, but not the numbers they're talking about. And I thank you a lot. Well, thank you, Dick. And, you know, the point that was brought up earlier, um, you know, the, the, the donor money, uh, which they give a nice name to athletic philanthropy, uh, is just uh, places particularly like uh, a, you look at A&M, Texas, Ohio State, Michigan uh, is enormous. And as, as Mickey pointed out, a lot of schools don't have that. And that may be, that's part of the evolution of, uh, of the NCAA. But uh, let's turn back to, to, to Ellen and Jason who kicked it off. Uh, questions that they have, comments they want to make about what they've heard. Uh, Ellen, you had a question that you wanted to pose to the players, and please, why don't we start there? This is fantastic. Thank you. Um, I was just curious to know what the terms of your uh, your athletic scholarships were. Were they four year guaranteed, um, so that whether you played or not, you you would still be able to stay at West Virginia, or were they one year renewable? No, no, they weren't renewable. I uh, know we had a four year contract. But then they changed that because of the four-year contract. Some of the kids decided they didn't want to play after the year, after their, their freshman year. And the university still had to honor their contract. Right. I know one of our teammates, his senior year, he wasn't playing much. He decided he was not going to play his senior year. So he got the same athletic scholarship that we did. Mm -hmm. I could, I could weigh in on that, uh, Alan. Uh, my, my scholarship award, which I'm very grateful for, had a clause in it until the completion of the undergraduate degree. Um, I pursued uh, my, my bachelor's of educa secondary education. So I needed, I needed the fifth year for the student teaching and, and fulfill the uh, 400 level uh, credits. Um, I didn't want to play. I had a, a year of eligibility left and I did not want to play. Uh, my, sh my shoulders uh, were pretty well beat up. And I remember having a conversation with Coach Biden going into winter conditioning. And I said that uh, I, I, I'm choosing not to participate in winter conditioning. I have to come back in the fall. And I don't want to not put my best on the field. So I'm asking if I could come, I could come back for my fifth year to do my student teaching, so on and so forth. And he looked at me and he said, Bobby, you're, you're, you're going to have your fifth year senior lead. I said, coach, I don't want to play. I want to pursue my degree. I've never had a chance just to be a student. It's always been student athlete. Um, long story short, you know, I made Dean's list my fifth year. Never did it before, but I did. And Coach Biden said, he said, Bob, uh, we will honor your scholarship. I wish you the best. If you need anything while you're here, please come in. So until the completion of the undergraduate degree, I had that clause in the uh, scholarship award. Yeah, yeah. The, the reason why I was asking the question is I'm, it's so moving to me to hear the commitment that you have to each other, um, to your institution, to your state, and the honor that you felt in terms of, of playing and representing um, West Virginia. Um, and and I, I, 
be because of the fact in 1972, there was that switch to one-year scholarships. I'm, I'm just wondering if, if, that, if that affected the culture, the climate, the, the way that, um, that, that you all related to the experience compared to what happened after, you know, after they became one-year awards. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing your insight on that. I think it's something that would be really interesting to hear more players talk about. Um, so thank you for, for um, shedding some light on that for me. Jason, let me turn to you. Um, knowing your work uh, and what you've done for your career, not only do you write very well, but you also have to have very well-developed listening abilities to then be able to convert what you're hearing into text. And you made that comment earlier. Uh, your thoughts, questions you might have, but your observations as we wind down uh, the program, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple of things come to mind. One, um, uh, I found the uh, reframing that Ellen brought up about the students uh, or employees who pursue a degree. Um, really helpful in thinking about this because I, I will use a um, sort of hypothetical often about, you know, students who are you know, a, a economics major or something, have a campus job uh, in, in some place or another, they get paid. But that's a student who's getting, who's doing sort of a part-time job. But I, I think the idea of, you know, an employee like me who has access to the academic um, opportunities at this institution, and there are many people in those positions who do that, I think that's maybe more analogous to what uh, the 24-7, 365 athlete, um, their situation. And so I think that's, that for one thing was a very helpful way to me to, to think about this in a different way than I have before. I also think it's it's really moving to hear former players who are still friends and talking about their bonds with each other. Um, and you know I think that says a lot about the value of, of sports and the value of having it in these institutions. And I, I wonder and and you know from from all of your perspective it seems very clear that the money would fundamentally alter that. And, and I wonder, and I, I don't know for sure whether, you know, I, I find that to be true from my perspective or not. I think the 24-7, 365 uh, situation that they're in um, together, I think will create some bonds that might be comparable to what you all experience in a different context under different circumstances. But, um, you know, the expectations and the pressure on them that really only they can understand, I think, to some degree. Um, will help create something similar to what you've experienced. And I think, the, you know, there are certainly will be these players who, who may leave after a year or two that may be sort of alienated from that group. And I feel like that's maybe part of the dynamic of a locker room too, whether there's the money involved or not, is that sort of the, the personalities and the friction, um, you know, where there's some great friendships and great bonds, but also some um, ways that those might fray given the competition within a team for playing time and all that. And then finally, the, the point about um, the, the few who go pro, um, which I think is, is a very important point and worth emphasizing over and over again. I used to laugh at the NCAA's um, you know, commercials about most of us go pro in something other than sports. One of them was a jazz musician. It was like jazz musicians' chances aren't much better than a, than a pro athletes. But, um, you know, so, but it was deemed better by the NCAA to pursue that. Um, but so it's certainly true. Like it's a, it's a tiny fraction. And, and and the way that I sort of view the, the current landscape is that that makes the money that they have access to all the more important uh, because this is the stage in their life where they may be able to make some money that they may not in other contexts. Um, they're, they're generating this revenue and if they're not gonna have that chance to play on Sunday in the eight figure contract, maybe now is the time when they are um, generating that revenue that they should get get a share of it. So I, I like everyone, I'd like to just uh, say thank you to everybody. I really appreciate hearing all these perspectives and I've learned a lot today and I'm, I'm leaving here with a lot of new ways to think about this. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. And I, you know, it's like you've taken the words out of uh, my mouth. I was going to say how important this has been a learning experience for me. And I think it says something important. And that is when the opportunity comes up, we can all talk with fellow fans and colleagues about, about what's happening in college sports. And uh, people may not agree with each other, but we can benefit from hearing what other people have to say. Uh, but as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the purposes of this program 
is to uh, maybe ignite some conversation and get people talking about something other than, are we going to win the game this week? Are we going to win the conference championship? What are our chances for a national championship? It's a lot more than about winning. So thanks all of you for participating. Uh, and for those of you who watched on YouTube, thank you for taking the time. This is Frank Fear for Future You. Goodbye, everyone.